96.3 FM, The Source. All right, five minutes after nine o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. So this morning we had this conversation about how we mispronounce the names of cities. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, and And quite frequently we're all wrong, or most of us are wrong, uh... And we have a book here, and I was saying Anubis, and I think you were saying Anubis, right? Yeah, I was and, wrong. And you didn't even share with me that you thought I was saying it wrong. You just kind of kept it to yourself. And well, no, because you usually are right. No, that's not true. <laughs> you, usually, I'm wrong with the pronunciation of almost everything. It seems like if, it's kind of like when you put the plug into the outlet. You know, uh-huh. you can put it <laughs> this way or that way. Yeah. One way it'll fit, the other way it won't. I always do the wrong way first. <laughs> <laughs> but I also didn't know anything about who Anubis was, and and uh, mm-hmm. so that that's kind of the cool thing about about fiction sometimes is that even though it's fiction and it's well, it's more entertaining, and therefore you're more likely to stay with it. <laughs> well, I'm speaking for myself here, um, but. You also learn a little bit about uh, history, even if it is mythological history in this case. Uh, Anubis, if I, uh, if I remember what I looked up when we first got the book, mm-hmm. was, I think, a god or a goddess. I never knew the difference. Uh, well, I know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> what do I mean? <laughs> never mind. One way is a skirt. Zeus was a guy. I know that. <laughs> anyway, anyway it was looking over the dead bodies, making sure that jackals don't eat them and stuff like that. Yeah. Which is horrible. Mm-hmm. I, n- I never knew that was going on in the world. Uh, uh, Eric Anderson ha- ha- educated us about this. He's a retired member of the United States intelligence community. He served tours of duty in Hawaii, Iraq, which I also was mispronouncing, by the way, Japan, Korea, Saudi Arabia, Washington, D.C. He's a contributor to the president's daily brief. Really? Uh, the National Intelligence Council, it goes on and on. I'm going to use all this time just reading his credentials. Yeah. Good morning, Eric Anderson. It's an honor to have you on our show. Good morning, Larry Robin. Glad to be here. And where are you right now? I live out on the northwest coast. Uh, so I'm, while you guys are sitting there in the sunshine basking in probably 80 degrees, we're here at, uh, well, this morning the sun's out, but it's at a crisp 50. So is that Washington or <sighs> Oregon? Where are you? What, well, Washington State. Ah, okay. I'm, I'm up. I'm I'm literally up at the northernmost point of the country at this point. Oh, is that right? Are you on an island? Uh, I'm up on the Olympic Peninsula. Okay, okay. We had somebody up there in an island, like right there on the st- on the st- the border, I guess. Yeah. Ah, uh, uh, yes. My friend's up in the San Juan Islands. Yes. I think that's right. So, Anubis. Um, t- I, we don't have a whole lot of time to really talk to you. So, let, let me get you to give the the gist of the story, so people will be interested in buying the book. What I'm doing is taking the the saga of where the Islamic State is headed, not in in the wake of something dramatic, which is what happens in the first book, but rather what happens when things appear to go awry, uh, as where they are today. And where I'm going to march you through is how an organization that appears to have been dissipated, we took away their capital and taking away Raqqa, we seem to have sent their forces fleeing across the deserts of Syria and down into uh, the uh, African uh, region. But th- what you have left there is still a organization quite capable of inflicting pain not only in Europe, but also within this country. And that's where Anubis takes us, is, is just how deadly this organization can become, even when it appears as though we've defeated it. And, and is there, I mean, you have such a background, so is this based on real things that are going on in the world? Yes, uh, sadly. I, I wish I could tell you that this came out of the fig newton of my imagination, but when you look at <laughs> the structural organization, it, it causes me to lose sleep, and I, I tell that to people. I, oh, okay. When you look at the structural organization and you look at the reporting that even you know you can pick up day in, day out from the, the media, you, you see that there is still sitting there a, a quite communicative uh, intelligence organization that, that takes place via the Internet, and you see the attacks that occur on a regular basis, yeah. and this is an organization that's saying, you know, we appear defeated, but we have not gone away, and we're just baiting to bide our turn, uh, and that's what, what worries me most, and that's what this book is about. We have such an inability to acknowledge that there's more than one way to skin a cat in, in this world, and, and I, I wish we would understand that, everybody would understand that, and maybe, and I hope, forgive the metaphor of skinning a cat, by the way, but I... <laughs> I, I, I just think maybe one day we could live in peace if we'd ever figure out that we are different and it's okay to be different. 
the, you know, this is one of the, the efforts that I've made within the book, and that is to explain the perspective on the political front, not only from the Western side of that equation, but also from the eyes of the leadership that sits there within the Islamic State. And so you get a chance to meet Mr. Baghdadi, and I've spent a lot of time researching his persona and, and the way that his politics operate and mm-hmm. the, the type of decisions he'd be making. This is, in fact, I, I tell people... This is a book that's intended to tell you that it, there aren't 50 shades of gray, there are 500 shades of gray. Uh-huh. We have to take that into consideration, and that's yes. what we're doing with this. Oh, my gosh. And that that is such a, a great thing to try to get us to grasp. Um, and, and I think telling it in a, in a story helps a lot if it's just if it's just factual you know that's always interesting but i think many of us including myself uh, kind of you know close the book early but when is it, when there's a story unfolding we keep the book open I'm, I'm trying to introduce my readership to a couple of characters that that actually exist at least the persona that i've met so you have this gunnery sergeant moore who is this crusty old marine who's tromping around you know he's seen everything done everything and you know yeah yeah been there and then we have uh, Major Fahim, who's the Army Major, who is really struggling to say, you know, how do I move forward in this and survive the politics because he understands what's sitting there, and at the same time have an impact on where we are going. And here's two gentlemen that are tasked literally with trying to save you know, the United States from itself, and at the same time we have Mr. Baghdadi, who's got an agenda of his own, and that is to redeem the caliphate to redeem what he thinks has been the, the blemishment of the, the Muslim faith. And uh, this seems to be on a uh, uh, parallel plane of the politics of the day during the Vietnam era. Yes. Uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, as uh, Adam Dunn will tell you, I, I, I work with Adam Dunn, he's my publisher, You know, the, the, the more that we proceed down the path, the more we begin to realize that history rhymes. Uh, and we are we are sorely seeing that that take place now with this negotiation that's preparing to set up between Kim Jong Un and President Trump. Yeah. If you go back and look at history, it looks very much like Neville Chamberlain getting ready to beat Adolf Hitler, uh, and it's it's sad. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. I often think that guys like yourself are in a way better position to be a president than the people we choose as presidents. And I'm not picking on Trump, and I'm not picking on Obama. I'm just saying that's the way it normally looks. And since you write the presidential brief, does that is that part of that? I mean, does do guys like yourself who have information that can actually help a president make a, an educated decision? Um, is that the role you, you have to play? It's kind of like all the worker bees, you know, kind of giving the queen bee the information that is necessary. I, I won't lie to you. There are days where it's very frustrating where you hand things over and you go, here, we have the right answer for you. We can't dictate policy. We can subtly suggest by providing the alternatives. Here's what happens if you do the following. Uh, but you have to realize that, that the president gets information from multiple sources, and we in the intelligence community are just one of the competing sources of data. And if, they, if the president chooses to ignore it, that's his business. If he chooses to accept it, that's also his business. And you, you have to take that as part of the profession. The, the tasking within the intelligence community is that you remain policy neutral. And so you can't decide whether you're going to be a Democrat or a Republican. Rather, you have to provide the best information possible to the man who has to make those decisions. Yeah, yeah. And the uh, uh, the uh, introduction of the fighting on a cyber cyber level in your book is very intriguing. The you know the world is changing. I I, I tell people that it isn't what you can blow up; it's what you can turn off. Mm-hmm. That that is, I think, should be a comment that frightens more Americans than it ter- than it currently does. Because, yes, my my goal as an adversary on day one of conflict is to take away your communications assets and to turn off your power grid. And at that point, you're going to sit at home and go, "Oh my, now what do I do?" Right, right. Uh, and that that's what what the military commanders are faced with, and that's what the White House is faced with. And this is such a wonderful book. I remember how exciting it was when you were on with your first book, Osiris. And it's really nice to know that you have this book, and now there's a third one in the works. Well, the third one is finished. Uh, I, I, I give Adam a hard time because he's the publisher. He decides on the timing of the release, but I. When he got to the third one, he goes, you know, I don't sleep well at night. And I said, that's the entire goal, Adam. I want you to think about where this rolls out. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I just, my, my two cents in, on this is that I think, okay, I'm the kind of guy that learns history better when it's somehow interwoven into a novel. 
And and so I think you're teaching us current events by interweaving it into a novel. That maybe that's what I wanted to say here, or into a series of novels. That, that's my intention, and it, and, I, and I'm like you, Larry. I I don't enjoy sitting there and reading dry history. The, the just the facts and only the facts gets to be quite old. But if you give me some sort of narrative plot to wander through as I'm doing that. You know, Lord forbid, as one of my instructors used to say, you, you might actually pick something up and take it home with you. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for coming on the air with us and getting up early to do this. Uh, I have a copy of Anubis uh, by R Eric Anderson. If you'd like the copy that was sent to me, call me, 622-9622. I'll leave it on the desk here for you. Um, the rest of us have to go buy it. I did find it on Amazon. And do you have a website dedicated to your writing or to the book? It, the, the website is Done Books, D U N N books.com That's easy enough, donebooks.com uh, Eric, thank you again for being on the show with us and good luck with everything You too, thank you and have a good morning Larry Robbins Thank you, we will be right back Is that couch cushion sinking lower every time you sit in it? Does your boat look better with the cover on? Has your car's interior seen its better days? Stop using a towel to cover up those rips in the golf cart. Isn't it about time you had it restored to better than new with a custom upholstery from Captain T? Captain T's upholstery has been right here in Ocala for nearly 20 years, so they know how to make your ride one of a kind. Whether you want to take that classic ride back to a factory look or put your favorite sports team front and center, Captain T's upholstery is who to call. 352-369-1810. That's 352-369-1810. Or stop by their location. 5030 South Pine Avenue in Ocala, just past the drive-in. And of course, don't forget to visit them on the web. Captain T.